The following is a Shaw TV public affairs presentation. Jazz Johal made his reputation as a tough questioner and investigative reporter. I bet Mary Polak is really glad tonight that he's on her side of the desk and not the other side. Good evening, welcome to Voice of BC. I'm Vaughn Palmer and to the, we're well into the fall session of the BC Legislature. First under the new government, and we have a couple of members of the opposition on the show tonight. Welcome to the show, Mary Pola. Thank you very much. And uh, that's a veteran, former member of the House, or a longtime member of the House, and we got a brand new member of the BC Legislature. Welcome to the show, Jazz Joe Hall. Thank you so much, Fun. Good to be here. Good to have you here. I'm going to ask you the question that everybody in media <laughs> asks Jazz, which is... <laughs> Were you in your right mind when you decided to go into <laughs> politics? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was. But you make a decision that's, um, that impacts your family, but also as a significant departure from what you did before. Uh, I, I was in the right mind. I had to be to make that decision. Um, I do enjoy it so far. I'm enjoying it. It's, um, there are days that are challenging. I think the, the thing you have to remind yourself is when you start, Everything here can be overwhelming, even though you've been here, you've covered budgets as a journalist. Um, learning the processes of government, how it works, debates and committees, all those types of things. So you have to sort of take all that in. And on top of that, then you've got the constituency side. So I'm learning all of that. And then on top of that, your family has to readjust as well, particularly when we're in session and you're away. You know, usually when I can't get home on Thursday nights, little guy's sleeping, he's eight years old. But I know next morning I've got to be up at 5.30 for hockey practice as well. So you can't forget that side as well. So the Joe Hall family, and Jazz Johal in, in this midst of transition right now, but I have been enjoying it, I, I must say. Uh, Mary Pollack, tell me, you're, you're a long stretch at the cabinet table and suddenly you find yourself in opposition. What's that transition like? I'm having fun. <laughs> it means you, uh, you, you shift what you're doing. I mean, I, I think uh, one thing about being a private member instead of being a cabinet minister, you can be about as busy as you want to be. There's endless projects and things that you can be working on. And I really, really like to do the research end of it and getting things ready for question period. I really enjoy that. And I have a lot more time um, to follow up on things more personally with my constituents too. Uh, we had a bit of a blow up this week uh, with between the opposition and the speaker, Daryl Plekis, over a ruling from him that it is no longer possible to use mock titles for ministers. So you can, you obviously call the Minister of Transportation the Minister of Transportation, but if you start calling a cabinet minister the Minister of Intimidation or the Jobs Minister the Minister for Loss of Jobs, the Speaker's no longer going to allow that. It's been standard practice in the BC House for a long time, but we have a new Speaker and a new ruling. Give me your take on it. Well, I'm, I'm glad you recognized it's been standard practice for a long time. I mean, I remember uh, Andrew Wilkinson being the Minister of Propaganda and Rich Coleman being uh, the Minister of Hot Air, among other things. I think Rich Coleman probably holds the honor of having the uh, most varied array of mock titles. Um, I, it concerns me. It concerns me from, from this standpoint, not because there's some great principle involved in being able to uh, use mock names for people, but because speech within the chamber holds a very special place in our culture and in our political life. It's one of the reasons why uh, members cannot be sued for using defamatory language in the House. I would think that kind of presupposes that there's going to be uh, some rather adversarial language. And that's, I think, often lost on people who haven't been part of um, this great Westminster system of ours. Why is it important, though? Well, it's important because passion should be brought to politics. You should be able to have adversarial debates. Some of the great debaters like Churchill used all sorts of insults uh, to the opposing sides. We do that there in that chamber so that it doesn't happen in other places. That's the basic idea. And of course, question period is one part, right? That's yeah. the theater of it. That's the sport of it. Uh, that's the parry and thrust of debate. Uh, the rest of the day we spend in committees and debating bills, and it's very respectful for the most part. So uh, it concerns me because it departs from um, 
something that I think is very important, and that is that you are allowed to be aggressive and to be downright rude in the House. That's actually called for when you're part of the opposition. Let me just jump in for a yeah, second here, Vaughn, because you know, this week um, I, I referred to the Minister of Transportation's Minister of Consultation Paralysis. So, you know, it wasn't a personal comment uh, towards yeah. the minister. Uh, it allowed me to, in a very short, simple words, articulate a frustration in regards to this particular project uh, going to, uh, once again, another, another study, another consultant looking at this, essentially kicking the can down the road. And the ability to uh, effectively communicate that in very short ways, in a quick way, I think that's very important as well, particularly because the media is watching and that's how the public generally disseminate uh, the news. And, and I think it's also for myself, you know, this is not only a coalition government, I think in many ways it's an accidental government and that the fact that they're studying everything to death now, I don't think they expect it to be in power. Um, so that's part of the process as well. We had 14,000 pages of consultation. I think you've written one or two columns on this as well. Many, many studies uh, and consultations with the City of Delta and Richmond and TransLink and Vancouver. So I think when you say consultation paralysis, once again, it's not personal, but it does articulate a certain frustration mm -hmm. uh, that I think on our side that we have and many people in Richmond and Delta have. I know it's a, a, a significant debate in that area, in Richmond especially, in regards to whether you want a crossing or not, but I do have to articulate that frustration when you've got uh, tremendous amount of dollars spent already in regards to the work, the prep work done. I mean, you go down Highway 99, there's sand that's already been piled up, tremendous amount of work done, and now we're going to do another study when we already got 14,000 pages of study conducted and a significant amount of consultation with the municipality. So in that way, I'm articulating and I'm, I'm trying to uh, have that conversation, not only with those across, but trying to articulate a message to those outside as well. And I also have to remind you, in this era of sometimes a political correctness, you go to university campuses today, you know, a lot of of times they get people get shut down now. I think this is a, a much broader conversation. If we can't have this have conversation in the legislature, well, we're kind of bringing the outside world in at this point, where you're telling yeah. certain legislators we're going to stifle the stifle uh, free speech, and that concerns me as well. So, uh, folks, uh, I've had email on this, obviously from people who uh, think that you know a better decorum in the legislature would be nice. <clears throat> Two things about that. First of all, we're talking about question period, which is a half an hour, four days a week. Most of the debates, if you tune them in, they're not like that. They're answer, question and answer, question and answer goes on. Uh, the other thing is, is if anybody out there thought that this was going to change the tone in question period, uh, we've only had two question periods under the new rule yet, the new edict from the speaker. Uh, they have been as chaotic as ever. And I sit in the House every day and have for many years, and I would say that uh, yesterday and today uh, there was as much heckling noise and it was as difficult to hear. So give it a chance. We'll see where it is uh, in a while. But uh, so far, if the goal was to improve the decorum in question period, it hasn't worked. <laughs> uh, big news, I would say, this week, and a lot of focus in the House on the government on November the 1st got a report uh, with a bunch of answers to some questions they asked about the fate of Site C, and the government is now settling in to decide the fate of Site C, but we've also had the Minister for Energy, the Minister of Energy up in the House on Site C and on uh, what's going to happen to hydro rates. Um, Jazz Joe Hall, we learned something pretty important about the possible impact on hydro rates if the New Democrats cancel Site C. Yeah, I mean, it's a 10% uh, increase uh, in rates. I thought, uh, first of all, it also speaks to the uh, effectiveness, effectiveness of our colleague, uh, Tracy Reddy's. You, you know somebody who knows the numbers based on the questions she was asking. I, you know, I've asked enough questions in my life as a journalist, and I was sitting near Tracy just listening to her, and you could tell she this just is knew. A, this is someone asking questions that already knows the answer. Exactly. Because she was on the board of Hydro. And, but she knows numbers as well. It was very impressive to yeah. see. And, and, and she asked uh, uh, those questions many, many times in different ways. And I think uh, the fact that she was out able to sort of get that nugget out uh, and, and uh, we were able to realize that, um, I think it does speak to the challenge that the NDP have right now in making that decision on, on, on Site C and moving forward uh, on Site C as well. I mean, I think at the end of the day, you know, having covered energy and working for the energy industry for a couple of years, but covering energy security in Asia, significant living in India and China, um, I think we sometimes forget how vital and how important hydro is, number one, to this province. Number two, we lead the world in a significant way in regards to clean energy. 
And we do need it. And we're going to need more of it as this province grows in regards to its population and the demands for electricity as well. For some reason, we've managed in this uh, province to turn every large project into a debate. At first, it was just a pipeline. Now we're talking about Site C, and we're having debates about the Massey Bridge as well. That's a big, big issue to the long, in speaking to the longer term uh, uh, issue number one, but also the image and the message we send to corporate boardrooms in Tokyo, to Beijing, to New Delhi. Are, it's very dangerous. And I could, I mean, if you've got time, I want to tell you a story. Last nope, year. I don't, want, I don't have time. Okay. <laughs> uh, but I will uh, think about it. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, just to get something else on the record, Mary Polak, because uh, uh, both the Greens and the Liberals raised this this week. So uh, see if we can get the issue so people get it. The, the government on Wednesday <coughs> announced a freeze uh, in BC Hydro rates. They were supposed to go up 3% on the 1st of April, and instead the government said that's a freeze. The thing that I thought was really interesting was within an hour, the leader of the Green Party was on his feet in the House, challenging the government on the veracity of that statement, Andrew Weaver. Now, the Liberals have jumped in on this as well, but explain to people what the issue is of, of freezing hydro rates without the approval of the BC Utilities Commission. Sure. Well, again, down to Tracy Reddy's, the critic, uh, who's done some great legwork on this, and she decided to press the minister after the release of the um, announcement as to how on earth they could deliver on a freeze in the context of the apparent 10% rate hike uh, that was being predicted through the BCUC report and what Hydro confirmed. Um, after asking the question numerous times, finally the answer came back, well, actually it's going to have to go through the process of application to BCUC, at which point um, Tracy Reddy's asked the minister, well, what happens if BCUC doesn't approve it? And the minister said, uh, we will cross that bridge when we come to it. And that, uh, as I recall, uh, caused the Green leader to rise to his feet uh, and uh, surprisingly announce that this, in fact, went in his mind against their confidence um, agreement with the uh, government because he had not been informed that that was the way in which this was going to go. He believed and was led to believe that it was a freeze and it was done and it was delivered. And I think most people, if they were to read the news release, and some in the media have commented on this, uh, would say the same thing. The news release does not uh, make it sound as though this still has to be reviewed. Uh, the commission is independent. Uh, past governments have simply ordered the commission to do things, but the New Democrats said they weren't going to do that. So we will wait and see what happens. Uh, the commission is kind of busy these days, so we'll see if they review it. We'll see if they approve it. In the meantime, uh, we've got a 10% uh, rate increase threatened if they kill Site C, and a 3% freeze, or a 3% increase that's frozen, uh, that is still hanging out there in the midst. So lots to talk about at the legislature. Uh, let's go to some questions on tape. <coughs> and we'll start off with Andrew McLeod of the TIE. Here he is. Some observers have questioned how well prepared the uh, Liberal opposition has been for question period in the House. Uh, sometimes the topics are repetitive. Sometimes there's not a lot of news uh, in the question period. I'm wondering how you respond to that. Trouble getting up to speed? Oh, I don't think so. Um, one of the things that I track in terms of a win or a loss in question period is did we manage to generate a new story, something that hadn't already been in the media? Because, of course, uh, when the government was in opposition side, that was often their thing, going to the clippings and ask the questions. Um, and I tracked in the first week, week and a half of our session, every single day we generated at least one story where we generated the story, it hadn't already been out there. And I think, too, uh, the fact that we have not seen um, media reports saying, wow, these guys really don't know how to ask questions. I, I think we've got a really, really good team, and I think they're doing very well. And sometimes the repetitiveness is because you're trying to drive a narrative, and you're trying to keep that cycle going. 
part of this is about what gets into the media clippings, but part of it is what you're generating within the house and what that's doing to the people on the other side. I mean, you know, a bit of this is that uh, almost like a sports team with your, your strategy. So, no, I feel pretty good about our team and how they've been doing, and we've seen some stars emerge that might have been unexpected in terms of their ability to ask questions. Too. I would From also your add- previous business, you were a professional at asking questions. What's different about doing it in the house? Uh, I think... Um, there's a first of all, the questions are longer in regards to just uh, the rapid fire nature of I think working in the media. Um, I think uh, you focus on a specific topic. You bring in more emotion. I find in the que- in, in question period. Although I try to do that uh, as a journalist as well, because I think people need to see that. They need to see you asking that question. And I think emotion plays a role, especially in question period, uh, in asking those questions. I also uh, re- would remind people that we're in early stages of this government. In many ways, this this session I would argue. Is uh, exhibition season. When their budget comes in February, then the then uh, regular season really begins, and then it's really rock'em, sock'em hockey. So if uh, the people are expecting us to be, you know, quiet, uh, reserved individuals come next next uh, next uh, spring, I don't think that's going to be the case. I think it's been pretty aggressive, and I think it's going to continue that way. I think it's just the very nature of, of the place and very nature of where we are right now in politics in British Columbia as well. I would just add that we tend to focus on question period when we think yeah. about that. Uh, but if you take a look, and some people do, maybe not very many, it's kind of dull stuff sometimes, but you take a look at the work that has been done in estimates, it's been quite remarkable the number of things that critics have been able to get ministers on the record with that are quite astonishing admissions, really, and I think will prove to be useful come February when it's time to hold them account for some of the things that they're claiming they're going to deliver on now. Uh, we've got another question on tape. This one is from Jamie Lawson, Political Science Department, University of Victoria. Here he is. Well, it's possible something could go wrong, but it seems as though corporate and union donations are going the way of the dodo in British Columbia. And based on other jurisdictions in Canada who've moved to that kind of system, it's the parties that have really good targeting of their memberships and highly computerized systems for fundraising who seem to be better off in that kind of a situation. Certainly true federally when the conservatives did well and the liberals did very poorly. Now, way back, I seem to remember that there was a bit of a tiff about the uh, low-hanging fruit regarding uh, contact with Uh, ethnic communities in BC, and behind that was an effort for the BC Liberals to get smart with their fundraising. Are you in a good position now to survive in a no-donations atmosphere, no corporate, no union donations, or are you going to have a lot of work to do to make it work in a new environment? So as I read the new rules, uh, there'd be a check for a million bucks uh, going to the NDP from the provincial treasury and about the same going to the Liberals based on the votes they got in the spring. Uh, January the 1st, uh, I gather from following your leadership uh, debate in the Liberal Party, there's some controversy over whether or not the party should take the money. What do you think? Well, at the end of the day, the party's going to have to make the decision, right? Um, individual <coughs> MLAs, even a leader, doesn't get to make that decision because there is an entity that is the political party, okay. and it has a membership, and it's going to have to make that decision. So I'm liberals sure, are sure voting against it in the House, right? Liber- yeah. We're voting against it in the House, and it is one of the areas that really concerns us. Uh, and, of course, we expressed that during the election. Uh, Premier Christy Clark was mocked for suggesting that that was what was behind this, and, of course, now we know it actually is coming to pass. I think, I think to his question, if this was only about whether or not you can survive without corporate and union donations, then I feel fairly confident that we can make that transition. We've already had uh, a monthly donor program that has been growing in popularity, um, and so that's something that we've watched other parties use successfully. My concern is around some of the other areas of the change that seem to favor uh, one party or another, especially in terms of uh, whether or not you have large bodies of people that can... uh, 
donate their time, if you will, and not have that calculated. And it's still not clear that all of those different areas where the NDP tends to do uh, better than we do at in-kind uh, types of uh, situations, it, it's not really clear if all of those types of scenarios are going to be covered off, and that could be a potential disadvantage. Uh, I'll take I a brief break on Voice of BC, and we will be right back, and Mr. Joe Hall will get to say whatever the hell he wants. When we get back here, he'll be right back. <laughs> Former Premier of British Columbia, W.A.C. Bennett, is said to have had such respect for taxpayers' dollars that he required his staff to come to him personally to ask to make a long-distance phone call. Why? Because it costs taxpayers money. We at the Canadian Taxpayers Federation expect all political leaders in British Columbia to have that same respect. I'm Mike Farnworth, the Solicitor General for British Columbia, sometimes known as the province's uh, top cop. And I'm here to let you know that it's a crime not to watch Voice of BC. Are you worried about getting diabetes? I'm a millennial. Well, sorry, but one in three Canadians has diabetes or pre-diabetes. Really? The Canadian Diabetes Association, with support from Sun Life Financial, urges all Canadians to take the test. There are more ways to connect with us at Voice of BC. Email us at vobc at shaw.ca. Follow us on Twitter at Voice of BC. Or like us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash VOBC on Shaw TV. When Premier John Horgan and his NDP colleagues were sworn into government in mid-July, they inherited an economy that's been among the strongest in all the OECD nations and certainly the strongest in Canada for the past three years, measured by overall economic growth, retail sales and also job creation. So from that perspective, they inherited a pretty strong ship uh, and we'll see where they take it in the next year or two. Welcome back to Voice of BC. Before the break, we'd had a passing reference to the BC Liberal leadership campaign. So a question from the Political Science Department at UVic, Jamie Lawson, about the leadership. And we'll have a little chat about it. Here's Jamie. I think many people out there in BC uh, who've looked at the events of the summer would say that after the last BC Liberal throne speech, there's probably some thinking to do that has to happen inside your party about the direction of the party. And that even given the fact that both Premier Clark uh, and other party members who were staying on disavowed that throne speech afterwards. Is this the right time to be having your leadership campaign? Or is the leadership campaign the way you're going to make those policy decisions going forward? So, Judge Hall, tell us how this thing unfolds, because uh, I know the leaders picked in February. You're chairing leadership debates right now around the mm -hmm. province. So how, how does the leadership unfold, basically, between now and then? Well, we have a, a debate upcoming in Nanaimo. Uh, we'll have one in Kelowna as well uh, in December, and we have a, a, a pretty large uh, debate uh, as well in January. Right? And these are open to the public? They open to the public, and there will be one, uh, we're working towards potentially one uh, involving the Indigenous community as well. We've had two prior, one in Surrey, one in Prince George. So we are traveling all over the province, and they're broadcast live on Facebook and social media as well. Uh, I think the candidates in the first one really try to sort of uh, uh, find their place, and the second one, there was a, a, a lot more interaction between the candidates. I think we're going to see a lot more of that moving forward. Uh, each one is trying to sort of carve out uh, their niche. I think everybody is trying to be a change agent of some sort, whether it's an outsider, whether it's someone uh, that uh, is new, whether it's somebody by age, everybody is sort of trying to carve out um, their po policies and where they stand. Uh, I think whoever the leader is at the end of the day, we're going to have to have a lengthy sort of policy uh, conversation afterwards. Um, I suspect that would be probably in the fall of uh, 20, 2018. Um, but I think it's going to be a different party. I just think that uh, that'll be forced upon us simply because of where we're at. And also I think there's a generational shift going on as well in regards to voting. 
voters as well. You, you saw that in the last election campaign. Uh, so I think that's a, it's a great time to have that conversation. And I think uh, so far what I've been hearing has been really good. And I think there's been, first, uh, there's been really good turnout as well. In Surrey had over 600 people. I think about 260, almost 300 people in Prince George as well on a, on a Saturday morning. So it's been really good. So there's a lot of engaged people. And I think it's, it's going to bode well for this party moving forward into 2018. Half dozen candidates at the moment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, I think they have to put up 25000 bucks if they want to go into the new year. And there's yeah, a membership to, cutoff at the end of the year. To go all the way through, I think the total is 50000 yeah. that they end up being yeah. uh, into that for. And yeah, the cutoff for memberships and to decide if you're going to be in the race is December 29th. We had a reference to this already, but uh, let's go back over it. Uh, the uh, the famous uh, notorious, perhaps, throne speech, uh, second Liberal throne speech, the one in June, uh, which uh, Jazz Joe Hall will now have a chance to disavow. Here is Ida Chong. <laughs> <laughs> Here's Ida Chong. <laughs> Jazz, as a new MLA, do you feel that you are at a disadvantage to accept all the decisions and the consequences? that the BC Liberal government has made in the past 16 years? And if so, how do you deal with that? No, uh, I don't, I've never met actually, so she's already throwing hard questions at me, so I'll have to, <laughs> I'll have to remind Especially her. Especially what she was like at the cabinet table. Uh, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. No, you know what, I, I, I think that we had uh, an opportunity uh, to let the party know after the election what we heard on the doorsteps. I knocked on doors for six months, uh, from November onward, before the election in May. And you could sense the generational shift and you could sense the issues around uh, daycare, uh, transportation, uh, affordability. Those are all there. And uh, I certainly articulated uh, those thoughts uh, after the election to the party, as all the members did. And uh, those were added to the uh, throne speech. Um, now, in hindsight, um, I probably wouldn't have put so many of those issues, those, uh, those, um, those uh, policies in at once, but certainly that's what I heard at the doorstep, and, and, and then we can't get away from that. That's the working age population, 25 to 54, which is essentially Gen X and Millennials now, and that's what they're here telling us, and that's what they're, they're feeling, and that's what we have to articulate. But the other thing that's happening starting next week is that this government made all those same promises and picked all those same issues. And I think it had a lot to do with why they picked up 10 seats in, in and around Metro Vancouver. They're now, starting next week, putting together their budget, which they're going to table in February. Uh, there are still a fairly large number of promises that the money is not there for. There are an awful lot of promises that are going to cost an awful lot of money. And it's one of the reasons why there were some subtle differences some of them not so subtle, between their throne speech, their plans, and ours. Daycare was probably the single best example of that. Um, the plan that we had in place wasn't $10 a day childcare. It followed the same model that we had been following previously, but expanded on it. Um, but yeah, they're going to have to find money for $10 a day childcare. They have to find money to meet their commitment to eliminate portables in Surrey. They have schools in other parts of the province they need to build. Uh, they're still claiming that they plan to build something to replace the George Massey Tunnel. But there again, the fact that the money's been taken out of the budget um, makes us concerned that they won't ever get to it. Same concern with um, infrastructure in the Fraser Valley, where we know there's been growing, growing um, movement of people out to the valley and now gridlock. Um, there were projects already uh, underway and projects that were to be funded to go further out and the money's not there. So. You know, these, these ministers are going to learn that when you go to Treasury Board, um, you don't get an automatic yes. And, and I think some of them are going to start to hear some no's. Yeah. And let's not forget the other one, 115,000 housing Oh, units. I forgot about that. 150, yeah, that that over, that over 10 years. So they've uh, announced... 28 billion. 28 yeah. billion, exactly. So 1,700, they've promised that 200 million bucks, 28 billion over 10 years. So that's three billion, almost 3 billion mm -hmm. a year, never mind all the other promises. Uh, NDP platform numbers unfunded so far, $10 a day childcare needs a billion dollars in the first three years. And the continuing phase out of MSP premiums needs a billion dollars over three years. So those are just two items. Uh, sir, but sir. that's the fun you get when you get into government. <laughs> and you've actually got to figure this stuff out. I think, uh, you know, I was, I was teasing Finance Minister Carol James today that uh, Treasury Board, the 
budget making process starts next week and she'll be making lots of friends on, on her <laughs> side and she said it's a good thing I have a thick skin because the finance minister spends a lot of time saying no. Right. Ida has a, f a fun question for you as uh -huh. well. Uh, you actually overlapped with her in cabinet. You must have. Uh, and in a, a couple years. of, we, we, um, she followed me in a couple of ministries yeah. too. So here she is. I cleaned up your mess, no doubt. Uh, here's, <laughs> Ida, here's Ida Chong. <laughs> Mary, can you tell us what was your favorite ministerial portfolio? Because as I see it, you are not the critic for any of those. In fact, you are the critic for education. Why do you think you were chosen for that? Was it because you were a previous school trustee? Might have been. A lot of, um, a lot of the appointments that were made, the people that had been minister were not put in as critic. They were given a sort of a fresh start, right? Yeah, my, my favorite ministry that I've ever uh, held was Children and Family Development, and really? I asked for it, and I asked for it, and I would go back there in a heartbeat. It's, it's considered a I, political I career it. graveyard. Well, but I, I loved it. I loved each and every day of it, as hard as, as some of those days were. That was my favorite. Um, I actually asked um, the premier when she was uh, still there if uh, I could have the education file. Um, okay. I, I felt as though uh, in in a role as an opposition critic, part of what you need is uh, a, a method by which you can uh, get information about what's going on. I still have many, many friends in the education system. I know many, many uh, people who work in civil servant positions, but also school trustees. So that gives me a fairly good trap line as, a, as an opposition researcher, getting questions together or getting ready for estimates. And it's also a file uh, that I've also enjoyed. Um, so uh, I wanted to do something different than the ministries I'd held, in part because I think you can, at least I felt tempted to, I think you can pull your punches when uh, you're looking across at uh, civil servants that you just finished working with a few months ago. Um, we've got a good question here from Bill Tillman. This issue, the legislation, the first phase of the legislation for this, before the House this fall, although after this we have a consultation and then we have an actual vote a year from now or thereabouts. So uh, where is all this going to go? Here is Bill Tillman. I led opposition to the single transferable vote in the referendums on electoral system change in 2005 and 2009, and I'll be opposing proportional representation next year. The BC Liberal Party also opposes proportional representation, but are you worried it'll become a partisan issue with people falling down on party lines rather than looking at the issue? And Bill tells me he thinks it's going to be tougher to turn this back this time because, uh, well, I would say the government's stacking the deck in favor of it passing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what's your take? I, on I think I think his question is actually better served for the NDP. I think everybody knows where we stand uh, on it. We we don't support it. I think it does uh, reduce the um, uh, reduce the impact, reduce the representation for rural communities. Um, and I think that it's a challenge. I think the NDP is going to have to have a conversation within their party as well in regards to where they stand. I and mean, I know the the premier has stacked the deck in regards to. Um, the 50 plus one. I know where I stand on it. I know where my colleagues stand on it. Um, to fundamentally reshape our political system like this, it's, it, I think it's going to not only impact obviously the political system, uh, but impacts uh, investment. And impacts, it impacts when boardrooms make that decision. Do we want to be going to British Columbia? We've got to go through lengthy environmental process, whatever it may be, and you have a government that isn't a government at this point because we have to negotiate something. And you see the examples around the world. Uh, I, I just I think we have it very good here. We're lucky here. And to shake up the system like this to make the Green Party friends happy, I just think uh, it's just uh, they're taking a huge risk in regards to our competitiveness and investment to this province, and I am I'm very concerned about it. There's turn, a turn back fairly decisively in the 09 election, 60% no vote. Mm -hmm. But structured on a regional basis, right? Okay. I mean, that's part of the challenge here. You've got two things, I think, that stack the deck in favor of the, uh, the change being what wins out. Uh, one of those is that this will just be a straight up vote. So there's no accounting for what percentage of support you have in different regions. In previous referenda, uh, you had to have not only a, uh, a majority um, that was, there was a threshold set, you had to hit that threshold, but you had to hit that threshold in a certain number of ridings around the province. So you had that regional representation. The way this has been rolled out, the the entire system that we have been functioning on since our founding uh, would could potentially be changed simply by um, a number of a majority of people on the lower mainland 
and uh, it, the voices of other British Columbians will be shut out. In addition to that, uh, it's one thing to have uh, from the times before where you had, you had a very simple yes or no question. Instead, to have a what appears is going to be a rating of different options. Well, if only one of them is the status quo, and then there are another four that are various uh, complexities, scenarios around uh, proportional rep representation, the likelihood that the status quo will win is really diminished. Uh, some of this is speculative, too, because we, we're getting the legislation, but we've not seen uh, the question. Uh, we've not seen question or questions, uh, what the ballot's going to look like. So there'll be plenty of time to talk about this next year. Uh, some of this will be coming in the spring. One of the many consultations we've talked about is one that supposedly will produce the recommendations on the questions and the ballot. Uh, we try on the show to uh, touch on a lot of the issues that are before the legislature, uh, we can't always do that. There's an awful lot going on at the moment. But here, President of the Press Gallery asking another thing that's happening at the moment, Tom Fletcher. Mary, your last cabinet post was environment, and your government spent uh, a lot of time and effort over many years uh, working with the federal government to remove duplication in environmental assessments. Uh, and I just heard from the fisheries minister, the federal fisheries minister, that there's still a lot of that left to go. Uh, the NDP have taken another tack on that, and they've even talked about returning to some parallel processes in the province. What do you think about that? Oh, that would be a shame. Uh, that would be a shame. And, and just so that people who don't live inside this bubble uh, understand, mm -hmm. We're not talking about reducing the amount of information that goes into the assessments. But for example, if you want to build something in British Columbia and it engages both the federal government and the provincial government, well, if they both want the same fish study, why should you have to produce it twice from two different consultants, right? Or the same uh, study with respect to uh, solubility of some chemicals in water. You can go down Air the list. Quality. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what the, what the model we had in place accomplished was to ensure that you still had separate decisions. You still had the federal government applying their uh, laws and regulations. British Columbia applied our own, made separate decisions. But the proponents weren't required to uh, do the same testing over and over again um, for the same requirements. Now, there are some differences, federal to provincial, and that was the nature of our agreement, where we were able to say, you know, we'll do the environmental assessment work, we'll add in the things that you require federally that don't exist in our system, and then uh, both ministers can retire for their decision. And it would be a terrible thing to go back. And the opponents, the people that had concerns about the project, didn't have to go through two processes That's either. Right. They could, they could get their consulting report and, and go through a single process and raise the same issues. It speaks to competitiveness you, too, by the way. Yeah. I want to add that. It speaks to competitiveness, yeah, one, because sure. especially having worked in the LNG industry. But I'm going to give you a much more <laughs> fun question. Here. I know you, you are. You get, to deal to with the, you get to deal with the ride-sharing issue. Oh, uh, thank you. Here we go. Here Christina we go. Winter, here's the question. Over <laughs> to you. Vancouver is the largest city in North America without regulated ride-sharing services. In March, the BC Liberals promised regulations for ride-sharing by the end of 2017, which all three parties agreed to during the election. Andrew Weaver has introduced a private member's bill that would allow regulated ride-sharing in BC, and he wants to work together with the other parties to deliver this to British Columbians. Since the BC Liberals have also introduced a private member's motion, asking the legislature to support the implementation of ride-sharing by the end of 2017, do you see a way that we can deliver ride sharing to British Columbians by the end of the year? No. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I think you answered the question for me, actually. <laughs> what, I think, why yeah. has it taken so long in British Columbia to do something that most of the other cities uh, this side of the Antarctic uh, are already doing? Our regulations in regards to the taxi industry are very complex. They're different from d d other regions. It's, it is oranges, oranges and apples. There, it is obviously a very strong lobby here. But that's not that's the situation here. I mean, if I talked to the folks at Lyft, they had come by I think a couple of weeks ago and had a very good conversation about. Um, they're one of the companies. Yeah, one of the, one. Yeah, and and they were actually very um, consultative, getting our advice, our thoughts. Uh, they said, "What should we? What do we need to be doing?" 
Now, you compared that to their good friends at Uber, who but had more aggressive in, 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 I think, in their marketing, and which I think that'll probably change with their new CEO and their corporate structure that's changed, and I think that's very important. Um, but I think generally from the taxi side, and I've certainly talked with them as well, you, know, you always hear level playing field. Level playing field can't be status quo. And that's the challenge. I think everybody has to come in in a spirit of compromise and let's get this thing done because it is going to happen. Nobody feels sorry for the travel agent who loses their job to Expedia or the, or the bank teller to, to, uh, to, to uh, apps that where we can do our banking or, for that matter, journalists uh, who get laid off as well because we're you're, all going to... Journalism is being turned inside out by technology? I never noticed no, this No, exactly. Before. But, you, but it's, it's <laughs> coming. Right? So that it, it, it has to come now. It has to be done. I think, obviously, the NDP, the government, is realizing the complexity of it and they've kicked the can down down the road again, one other issue there. We support bringing it in in 2017, get it done. But it's up to them at the end of the day. But I think we cannot wait another four years. We cannot keep kicking this can down the road. We will take a brief break on Voice of BC and we will be back with one more segment. Stay with us. Thank you. One of the weird things that we're going to be looking at in the next few months is the picture of our major parties trying to find positions that actually go against their core constituencies. Seems to me the BC Liberals' task right now is to find ways to reconnect themselves uh, with people in Metro Vancouver and people on the island. For 600,000 Canadian veterans, remembrance is more than just one day a year. After service, many veterans suffer traumatic memories, a lack of purpose, and isolation. But there is hope. The bonds of brotherhood don't end after service. The Veterans Transition Network provides a chance to heal, find understanding with loved ones, and discover meaning in the civilian world. Find out how we help. Mary Pollock had a very good run as a BC Liberal cabinet minister in several portfolios. But Jazz Johal, not so much. You have to feel a little sorry for Jazz. He just got into his desk, he just got his business cards printed, and boom, it was all over. And now he has to wait, perhaps a very long time, to get it back. You know, the nice thing about having been in the news media is everyone's so nice to you after you leave. Uh, is that my retirement leave. video? Yeah, yeah that's your... Uh, anyway, uh, let's go back because we've got a lot still to talk about on the show and I wanted to get a few more in. So, Bruce Halser, this is a targeted question to Mary Polak. Here's Bruce. Mary, your part of the province is usually pretty reliably free enterprise. Right next door to you in, uh, in Surrey... And, and Langley is where a lot of people say the BC Liberals lost the last election. Why do you think that is? And what do the BC Liberals have to do to gain back those seats in Surrey and Langley? So about 10 seats, right? Yeah. Uh, went from Liberal to uh, NDP in yeah. around Metro Vancouver. There's, uh, there's no one answer. And uh, we didn't lose any in Langley. Just to be clear, (laughs) Um, there's no one answer. There never is. I think there was a combination of how we handled some of the nomination processes in Surrey. I think that affected us negatively. eh? Yeah. Um, I certainly think that some of the issues that we were focused on, um, our message, you know, you take affordability, for example, I don't think uh, our message was as strong as the uh, now government's message was. Um, but there's, there's never one factor. What do we need to do to get back in? It's the same, uh, same as, uh, as oppositions always have to do. Uh, once we choose our leader, we need to be articulating a clear vision for what we want to deliver, and it has to be consistent, and it has to be something that resonates with people. And I think in order to accomplish that, the next leader is going to have to do a significant amount of work reaching out to people across British Columbia and making sure that members of uh, their caucus are doing the same thing, pulling up their socks, getting out there, talking to people, and finding out what uh, folks actually want. Heard you earlier, uh, Jazz Johal, talk about from knocking on doors what some of the issues you heard as well. 
I'm going to go to a question on tape here for you, uh, partly because of uh, what you used to do uh, between media and getting into politics, and partly because, it, it, to me, is still one of the big question marks. Mm -hmm. Looking ahead in British Columbia, I think the Premier has indicated that it's a question mark for him as well. So uh, let's go to Jordan Bateman and talk LNG. Here's Jordan. Jazz, you've done a lot of work on the LNG file over the years, but it's grim times for that industry right now. Petronas pulled out, Aurora was cancelled, and we've heard from Wood Fiber that they're going to delay their final investment decision for another year. Was it ever realistic that we were going to have a huge LNG industry in British Columbia? It's starting to come back a bit, though. You're right, it is coming back, especially the last uh, two or three months uh, with uh, China buying a lot more LNG in the spot market. Um, you know, when, I was, when you look at an LNG industry, two to three plants, that's a large industry. There's never going to be 20, so let's put that aside. Two to three plants is a big industry, and that's what we should be thinking about. The loss of PNW is, is is a huge issue, and I think if we had been in power, I think we probably would have been able to work and find that's a solution. That's the Petronas. There. Petronas yeah, project, yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, now, the next one to watch, I think, is probably LNG Canada. Aurora was not, uh, in Kitimat. That's the Shell project with the uh, Korea, China, and Japanese interests as well. The Aurora project wasn't very far. It wasn't hadn't moved ver yeah. very much, so uh, that one stopped very early. There is a glut of uh, LNG uh, in, the, in the world today. The next opening is probably going to be about 2025. So there's usually a four to five year build for these projects. So these boards, these large multinational energy boards, will make a decision probably the next year or two whether to move ahead with some of these projects. Maybe a little bit later, but that's why the next year or two are very important in regards to LNG, particularly that project and watching it in competitiveness. Second issue today, and, and I think I've, I've raised this a little bit, is um, the fact that we've taken long, so long getting uh, these things uh, through the regulatory process and some of the challenges in regards to communities, First Nations communities and all of that, is the uh, um, American industry has been racing forward. Uh, and the Gulf Coast is now a significant player. We should have three, maybe even five LNG plants down there. And they're selling uh, LNG all the way to uh, Europe now, to South America, and now even through the Panama Canal, because it's expanded as well. You pay about $355,000 to go through. So they're actually getting ahead, or moving ahead, while we're still having these long, long debates in regards to whether or not we should move forward. And that goes back to what I said earlier in regards to competitiveness and what uh, corporate boardrooms around the globe are thinking about us. I had a conversation with somebody in India last uh, October when I was there. And they were saying, they, just ask, they, they said, Mr. Joe, i got one question to ask you after I gave him a presentation. We heard about LNG in BC in 2011, initially. Yep. We've had some of your proponents come and ask us about investing. We want to save about 5% of our portfolio for you. We can buy from Australia. We've been trading with the Iranians for 1,000 years and Qatar as well. But we want to save some of it for you. Why can't you guys get past the, get these things past the finish line, yeah. right? This is an, a corporate boardroom in Mumbai. It's a good question. So the long term impact of these debates, I don't care where you sit, is going to have a uh, uh, is going to affect British Columbia. So we have to be focused. The labor side, the education side, First Nations, the government, all levels of government, in getting these projects through. Because that LNG Canada project goes through. That's forty billion dollars. That's the largest private sector investment in this province. At its peak, when they're building it, it'll be one of the largest industrial projects on the planet. And it'll have an impact in reducing GHGs globally. In many ways, it's a no-brainer, but we've got to get this thing done. The Premier toured that site recently. John Horgan went up there on the weekend uh, a few weeks ago and said uh, that he supports it. Yeah. Do you accept that? I would find it easier to accept if he was brave enough to come out and say he actually supports fracking. Um, at the end of the day, one of the things that John Horgan has never come to grips with is that you can't just say you support an LNG industry if you don't support the method that you need to use to get the gas out of the ground in the first place. And he is very fond of staying on that fence so that he can please the people who want to see him supporting resource sector jobs. It's a challenge within their caucus, right? The folks that want those resource sector jobs and the ones who want to be green. And then at the same time, keep, keep the green folks happy by saying, no, no, I, you know, I'm not sure about fracking. We're going we're gonna, to, oh, I'm not, I'm not going to support that. So I, that's where I wish he would come clean is, you know, fine, uh, say you want to boost LNG now after opposing it for all these years. But uh, if you don't support getting it out of the ground, couple of more topics to get through before the end of the show. Uh, here's one. Uh, what do we got here? Oh, this is Bill Thielman again, and this is for Jazz. Here's Bill. Mr. Joe Hall, you're a critic for jobs, trades, and technology. What advice would you give to the BC NDP on how to proceed? What sort of things should they be doing to encourage investment, encourage trade, encourage creation of jobs that might not be seen as simply partisan? 
Uh, I'm glad Bill's asking for my advice. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, the world is shifting, uh, and we've all seen it in regards to Asia's rise. 60% of humanity lives there. 35% of the wealth is there. That's going to continue to grow. We need to do a better job in making sure the boardrooms in China, in Japan, in Korea, in India, uh, to Thailand, the Philippines, understand uh, what it means to do business in, in this province. We have to remain competitive. I know there are traditional uh, debates within that party between the Greens and the Browns, as, as uh, Bill Thielman has, has uh, stated many times. That debate is still there. LNG is a classic example of that. Site C is another uh, um, uh, issue as well. So they have to have, first of all, an internal conversation where they stand on this. We can do both things. We can build here. We can uh, extract resources in this province uh, in, in an environmentally sound way. But to have these, uh, to have the now environment minister tour the province with the with the uh, with the former producer of gas on, which is anti natural gas, to have the uh, uh, energy minister speak out against natural gas and resource extraction when she was in opposition, for that the premier to send a letter uh, to the uh, to the prime minister opposing one of the projects, that's not. Uh, the right message you need to be sending. So there's an internal conversation that they need to have within their party, a fundamental conversation, or they're going to continue having to dance between, we don't oppose this unless we get elected, of course. And that's what you're seeing here. Beyond just the green NDP conversation and minority government that we see, the green-brown uh, debate within that party is still ongoing. That has not been solved. We don't cover it as much. We don't talk about it as much. But it is fundamentally there, and it is going to stay there. Uh, and you're going to see it once again with Sightsee. Before the time runs out on the show, Mary Pollack, we've got two questions for you on the education front, and here is the first one from Maureen Karagiannis. Here she is. So my question is for Mary Pollack. Uh, recently, the Chilliwack School Trustee, uh, Barry Neufeld, has come out and uh, made some very disparaging remarks about the inclusive curriculum for LGBTQ children. Um, we have seen him say things like, uh, I'd rather live in Russia or Paraguay, countries that, of course, have notorious human rights violations against that community. Many politicians of many stripes have come out and condemned these comments, including the Minister of Education, but you as the critic have been particularly silent on this. Now, I know you have some controversy in your own background about it, but I'd be interested to know how you feel about the curriculum and what you feel about the comments made by Mr. Neufeld. Yeah, his, his comments were just awful. And uh, as I understand it, he has since uh, apologized. And probably the worst was that he posted some things that were very directly bullying, if you will, uh, with respect to making fun of people uh, who were transgendered. So uh, let's be clear, there's no, there's no hidden message in uh, not having come out and said anything about it. Uh, to be honest, as opposition, a lot of times people don't come out and ask you. Uh, let me correct one thing, though. It's important because what is really important here is to get rid of the misinformation. This isn't curriculum. And one of the things that the opponents of this have used is frightening parents into thinking that this is a change in curriculum, that they're going to teach their children uh, to disrespect their parents' views. Uh, goes down the list and there's some horrible stuff on some of the websites uh, that purport to say what this is. Here's what it is. We had an erase bullying program that was fantastic, uh, world renowned. It was recognized that we needed to make sure that sexual orientation, gender identity was also covered in that anti bullying effort. And so, what's called SOG123 is the addition to that program to ensure that all kids are safe, be they gay, lesbian, straight, bisexual, transgendered, questioning, it doesn't matter. We know from the research that when LGBTQ students are safe in schools, that everyone is safe in schools. And uh, we have to confront the misinformation that is out there uh, about SOG123. It's not uh, an addition to the curriculum and it's not part of some kind of gay agenda. This is about making sure all of our kids are safe. I appreciate the clarification on that because I agree with you. I have seen some suggestion that this is something that's going to be taught in school. What's being taught in school is not to bully people for the way they are. That's what's being taught in the exactly. school system. Uh, another question before we get out of time on education. Uh, Jordan Bateman, here he is. Mary, Education Minister Rob Fleming has said that they will get every single student out of portables in Surrey uh, by the time the next election rolls around. But there are 7,000 students in Surrey already in portables and another 1,000 join the school system every year there. How on earth 
will the NDP meet this commitment to build 20 to 25 new schools in less than four years? After this one out? Well, I spoke to the previous education minister because the current one in estimates didn't have a, a cost to give me, and he uh, said their estimate was, at the time, $500 million. And that would just deal uh, with the existing portable classrooms. As Jordan points out, you're seeing a 1,000 new kids joining every year. So uh, same old story in Surrey, right, from even when I was a school trustee. Um, but here's the challenge for the New Democrats. Um, they made this commitment. Uh, interestingly, the Premier, John Horgan, seems to be backing off. He claims that when they made the commitment, the court decision hadn't been made, and so now everything's changed. It's going to take more time. Well, it's actually not true. The court decision was in place long before the writ dropped on the election. This is um, the Supreme Court of Canada correct. decision, that the, the long court case won by the teachers' union. Which means that there are more teachers added, which makes the job of eliminating portables even more challenging. Um, but when I was in estimates with Minister Fleming, he said he still thinks that they can keep to that time frame. So, uh, again, another big money question for the new finance minister, because uh, not only do they have to get that $500 million in for Surrey to get rid of the portables, uh, they better start building them. It takes about three years to build one. And uh, then they have to deal with all the other school districts. Chilliwack. Uh, Chilliwack has more kids per capita in portables than Surrey does. So uh, Langley, fast growing. We have schools that are bursting at the seams. And these are projects that were already on the books. So uh, are they going to perhaps delay some of the other school projects in order to deal with their commitment to Surrey? I don't know. 2018 is going to be a busy year for the government and a busy year for the opposition. We're almost out of time, so I think we've got two questions left. So let's see if we can get through them, shall we? <laughs> One for you, Jazz Joe Hall. Here's Andrew McLeod. The government recently announced its new group that is tasked with giving advice on climate change and how to address it. Uh, the group looked very similar to the old climate leadership team and in fact an early draft of the press release used that name. I'm wondering what that says about the approach back when you were the environment minister, Mary. Oh well, all right. It's a go. question for me. Yeah. <laughs> you can deal with the last one. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I'm surprised that they're going back at the recommendations again or getting recommendations because of course all through my time as environment minister after our after the report came out and all through the election I heard nothing but just do the recommendations you have the recommendations follow up on the recommendations um, it would seem now perhaps uh, they're not as as happy to do that or perhaps they're just kicking the can down the road but they're already setting setting themselves up for some challenges one carbon tax the previous team told them told government not to raise carbon tax without something in place to protect emissions intensive industries and uh, now with the site C decision um, there would be an enormous challenge for them to do the electrification of natural gas production upstream. Uh, very, very difficult to do that in a world where hydro says they can't use the alternative energy uh, portfolio that's been in the BCUC report. So they're already stacking the deck against being able to achieve their uh, climate targets and uh, why they wouldn't just go through and uh, uh, adhere to the report that they claim to love so much, I'm not sure. Meanwhile, the tax is certainly scheduled to go up, uh, five bucks mm -hmm. uh, a ton of emissions uh, starting on April the 1st. About two and a half cents a liter at Yeah, but two and a half tank. cents a liter in gas. Uh, yes, we do have time for one more question, and yes, we do have one more question, and maybe you both want to talk about this one. Here it is, Bill Tillman. You've got a Liberal leadership campaign going on until February and a lot of candidates. Do you see anything going on in terms of a split between those who might be federal Liberals or leaning that way and federal Conservatives and leaning that other way? And will they be able to come together at the end of that fairly divisive leadership campaign? It was pretty divisive on that issue last time. Took yeah. a while to patch it up. Yeah, I mean, I, I get a front row seat to these debates, <laughs> and uh, and I think uh, people are very respectful. Uh, I, there's going to be pointed questions uh, as we move forward, and I get that, and it gets divisive at times. But you know, I I haven't sensed that. I haven't sensed that conservative, federal, liberal. Uh, fight or disagreement, and there'll be some disagreements on policy here and there, but I don't think it's divisive as some people think it is. It's a bit of a cliche in this time, in this case. I'm glad that we have all these people who want to run for leadership and have
have uh, put their name forward. But no, so far all of the, the debates have been very respectful. They have disagreed on things. The crowds have been energized. They're what they actually. What the complaints that I get sometimes is, you know, we want the candidates asking themselves more questions, and we've tried to include that in the debates. But I haven't seen that divisiveness. There's going to be some probably, but I haven't seen that divisiveness where it will impact. Uh, the leadership yeah. moving forward in 2018. I just haven't seen that. And well, caucus Christy is different. Clark last yeah. time uh, was a liberal, and yeah. some of the conservatives in the party said there's going to be an issue. It took a while. It she, took a while. She had to work to patch it up. Caucus was very different then, though. And okay. I mean, I'm not sure how many um, how many folks you had in caucus who were telling you all about uh, the way caucus operated then. I'm sure you Enough. had. A f- I'm sure you had a few. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a nice place to be. I mean, there was already just a divisive nature within caucus. It had been through some pain times and there were a lot of hurt feelings and uh, a lot mm-hmm. of uh, factions within caucus. I, I honestly don't sense that now. Um, it really feels like a group that's together, certainly not on party lines. And so we say farewell. Thank you, Mary Paula. Thank you. Show. Appreciate it. Thank you, Jazz Joe Hall, for being on. Thank you for watching Voice of BC, bringing the legislature BC politics into your living room. Good night. is a community access program. While this program does not necessarily reflect the views